Mother Nature is a shocking exhibitionist. Earth writhes with internal contortions. The planet sizzles and swirls. Sometimes a natural event qualifies as a full-blown disaster, a sudden catastrophe created by natural processes and dealing large-scale loss of life. In the last century alone, the death toll from combined natural disasters has reached 10 million people, often thousands at a stroke. Caught in the grip of such forces, we are often powerless and in the aftermath stunned. Yet such events should come as no surprise when we inhabit a planet moved by the laws of physics. The move it does on the surface and deep inside. Internal forces give rise to earthquakes and volcanoes. Shifting external forces cause hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, and blizzards. In one day, there may be five hurricane force storms brewing, at least 15 volcanoes actively erupting, four major earthquakes plus a handful of tornadoes. And at any given moment, there are 2,000 thunderstorms lashing the earth. They don't even qualify as natural disasters. No disaster will strike, but where and when? A Japanese proverb says, a natural calamity will strike at about the same time the terror of the last one is forgotten. Could it be that one catastrophic event is somehow linked to others? 1982 was an intriguing year. Springtime and a volcano erupts. El Chichon in Mexico. Soon earthquakes shudder across the Pacific underwater. Sea level in the mid-Pacific rises by up to 10 inches. Farther west, sea level drops. And ocean temperatures soar. Precipitation up to 300 times normal produces avalanches in South America. Had this sequence of events been triggered by the volcano's eruption? kind of domino effect. According to modern physics, a tiny incident may influence something larger. For instance, when a storm is developing, even the flap of a butterfly's wing can play a part. As we wonder what will be next, it all seems so random. But it isn't random. Natural disasters are natural processes pushed to the limit. We can begin to comprehend them and even animals may help. Haicheng, China, 1975. Tremors racked the earth and wells began to bubble. Snakes awoke from hibernation early and froze to death in the snow. Rats had lost their fear of humans. The signs were clear. A massive earthquake was imminent. An animal's role in foretelling disaster was described by Plutarch in ancient Greece. In Sparta, 469 BC, a group of boys were exercising when, strangely, a rabbit ran toward them. Some chased the disoriented animal. The others were crushed in an earthquake. When Haicheng's earthquake struck in 1975, there were 90,000 residents, but only 300 were killed because people responded to the warning signs. The devastating quake struck China 18 months later. Its death toll was estimated at 
half a million. We cannot yet predict many earthquakes, but at least we know more about their causes than our forebears did. In 1755, a huge earthquake in Portugal was believed by the Spanish Inquisition to be divine punishment for a sinful population. So the Inquisitors had even the survivors roasted alive. The Earth's surface lies in pieces, huge tectonic plates. When they grind together, earthquakes result. Each plate is as thin in relation to the globe as apple peel is to an apple. When molten rock beneath the skin escapes, there are volcanoes. Volcanoes and earthquakes are most likely along the edges of the plates, like the gigantic loop known as the Ring of Fire. The erupting Earth has long inspired superstition and legend. The Maori of New Zealand believe there is a god of earthquakes and volcanoes. He was feeding at his mother's breast when she turned face downwards and accidentally pressed him into the earth. He has been growling and spitting ever since. About 50 volcanoes erupt each year. Roughly 15 are active year round. The rest blow their stacks sporadically. About one-tenth of the world's population lives near a potentially active volcano. In 1991, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted, throwing out millions of tons of ash and dust. As it spread through the atmosphere, it affected the climate of the whole world. Near the eruption, the skies were darkened for days, and the ash caused havoc for human and animal life. Such a volcano is a mere blemish compared with the potential for disaster. 90,000 people died when the island of Tambora erupted in 1815. It spewed five times as much debris as Pinatubo, deep enough to bury the Empire State Building. That summer, far away Europe felt the effects of the monster volcano. There were strange sunsets and exceptional rains. The writer Mary Shelley, like many others, was forced inside. Shelley used the time to write a monster hit, Frankenstein. More recent eruptions have also brought surprises. In 1996, a volcano in Iceland melted a glacier. Fire and flood in one natural event. A volcano can also trigger lethal landslides. Animals are even more defenseless than we are when it comes to such sudden events. But if enough survive, they can repopulate regions that are prone to catastrophe. Earth's volcanic personality does have a positive side, mineral-rich soil. A volcano can put a whole new mountain on the map and even provide the souvenir ash trays. Some coastlines are visited by another deadly disaster, the tidal wave called a tsunami. The highest ever recorded struck Japan with full force at a height to rival the Statue of Liberty. In open ocean, waves can travel at colossal speeds, as fast as a jet plane. They slow down as they approach the shore. The term tidal wave may have come about because the waves come in succession, like the tides. The first blast of water will be followed by others.
a tsunami is actually a seismic sea wave caused when Earth's tectonic plates collide beneath the sea. Hawaii is at great risk, right in the center of the Ring of Fire. In 1946, a tsunami raced to the islands from a source near Alaska. At Hilo, parking meters were bent double, railroad tracks ripped up, and 159 people died. Many people believe that the Minoan civilization on the island of Crete was destroyed by a tsunami following the eruption of nearby Santorini around 1500 BC. Just a century ago, 36,000 people were killed by a tsunami in Indonesia. The wave was still almost knee-high when it reached South Africa. It even caused a surge in the English Channel. But a tsunami is just one act in Earth's repertoire of deluge. More people die in floods than in any other kind of natural disaster. Over half of the world's population lives near a river or sea coast, water with the power to kill. As rising flood waters rampaged across history, flood legends rose with them. Noah is perhaps the most famous survivor to beget new generations. The Wangha River, also called the Yellow River, has broken its banks more than 1,500 times. In 1887, it flooded an area of 50,000 square miles, killing more than a million people. No wonder the river is known as China's Sorrow. Water, not earthquakes, triggers most landslides. Each raindrop strikes the earth with the force of a tiny bump, shifting soil with every splash. But flood waters can bring benefits. If not for the regular flooding of the Nile, enriching and replenishing the soil, the ancient Egyptian civilization could never have developed. Yet when disastrous flooding strikes, it is often beyond our power to do much more than weep. Bangladesh is especially prone to flooding caused by yet another form of natural disaster, the tropical cyclone. The same kind of storm is called a hurricane in the Atlantic and a typhoon in much of the Pacific. They all deliver one thing in common, destructive power. About 40 such storms rack the planet each year. Each inhuman event is given a human name to distinguish it from all others. Hurricane Andrew struck in 1992. One of the most costly disasters in American history caused an estimated $30 billion worth of havoc. Hurricane is not caused by internal forces, like volcanoes and earthquakes, but by energy reaching us from the sun. Earth receives more solar energy per minute than humans can use in a year. The heat sets up ocean currents and evaporates vast quantities of water at the equator. This creates hot, moist air, which is driven to the cooler poles in a process that works like atmospheric air conditioning. Amid the routine turmoil, the mother of all storms is born. A hurricane starts innocently, a mere disturbance. Given a spin by Earth's rotation, the storm steadily builds, drawing energy from the moist tropical ocean air. When it hits land, a wall of water piles against the coast. The storm surge causes 90% to fall hurricane deaths.
The word hurricane comes from the Carib Indian word hurricane, meaning big wind. Typhoon may come from Tufan, the father of the winds in Greek mythology. All great enemies deserve a name. An Australian forecaster named Cyclones after politicians he disliked. He described them as wandering aimlessly or causing great distress. During the Second World War, the first pilot to spot a hurricane gave it a name. Suddenly, hurricanes had female names, those of favorite girlfriends. Now, male and female names get equal time. While Asian nations prefer numbers to names, to its victims, any hurricane can seem like number one storm. Attempts to tame the hurricane by seeding it with chemicals, for instance, have been abandoned. More accurate prediction is the best hope for avoiding loss of life. A huge storm's fury can yield rewards. Japan receives one quarter of its annual rainfall from typhoons. From out of Earth's arsenal of storm troops comes another phenomenon that uses guerrilla tactics, a tornado. The twister's profile is one of the most frightening sights anywhere, whether it's thick and white or thin and black. One capricious twister carried a jar of pickles for 25 miles, then set it down unbroken. Another split open a telephone pole and inserted a straw. One infamous tornado, the Tri-State, swept across three Midwestern American states in 1925. In three hours, it killed 689 people. Tornadoes are spawned in hurricanes or thunderstorms. In the United States, there can be at least a thousand in a year. A tornado usually comes from the back of a storm, where a stream of cool air heading down spins into warmer, horizontal winds. Because the tornado's winds spiral inward and upward, they create a vacuum capable of sucking a house off its foundation. Incredibly little more is known for certain. Tornadoes make difficult research subjects. A Kansas farmer was one of the few people to look into the center of a twister and live to describe its internal lightning and mini tornadoes. Preventing twisters remains impossible, and tornado proof homes have yet to be invented unless we stay underground. Compared to a tornado, a blizzard may seem benign until the lightning starts. Lightning is one act of nature willing to perform almost anywhere. It illuminates blizzards, tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanic eruptions, and even sandstorms, in addition to thunderstorms. A blizzard is a result of colliding weather systems, named fronts because they behave like armies massing for war. When a cold front pushes up like a wedge under a warm front, its moisture can condense and fall as snow. Blizzard has strong horizontal winds, driving large amounts of snow and temperatures well below freezing. Fortunately, blizzards are rarely the killers they once were. The American blizzard of 1888 took at least 400 lives. But a blizzard like the Siberian Purga is still a force to be reckoned with. People may freeze to death only a few yards from their homes, lost in wind-whipped snow. Blizzards also take a heavy toll on livestock and wildlife. They are extremes for which animals have little defense, even those used to snow. Snowshoe hares pack down the snow on their regularly traveled routes, 
making snow highways and easier travel. After a blizzard, the hares must start all over again. But the snowfall is like money in a bank, vaults of frozen water to be released in the spring. However, sometimes a bank of snow does not sit and wait. It becomes an avalanche. A slope with an angle of 30 to 45 degrees is the most likely setting for disaster, along with the buildup of snow or ice. An avalanche may be a cascade of loose granules with the snow behaving much like dry sand. Or an avalanche may begin when a sheet of high density snow breaks away from a weaker layer. As it falls, a slab can gather up 100 times more snow. Compacted snow buries victims so tightly that unless they are rescued within the first half hour, there is only a 50% chance of survival. Compared to other natural disasters, few lives are lost in avalanches. But during the First World War, more than 60,000 soldiers were killed by avalanches in the Alps. 10,000 died in just one day. Today, dogs remain the best searchers. They outperform radar, infrared detectors and even lasers. St. Bernard dogs were so named for the rescue work they performed alongside monks from the Swiss monastery of St. Bernard. Switzerland, which has the highest number of fatalities, has seen some mountain villages destroyed several times over. According to Swiss legend, an avalanche can be triggered by the chime of a bell, the crack of a whip, or even the beating of a bird's wings. The White Death is still a threat, but villagers fight back, deploying anti-avalanche weaponry from architecture to trees. For all the problems caused by precipitation, its absence produces another kind of natural disaster, drought. A prolonged period of no rain can occur in virtually any climate. It's not only people who suffer. Plants and animals die of thirst by the thousands. Unlike most natural disasters, a drought takes its toll gradually. The greatest threat to human life is not the drought itself, but the famine that is likely to follow. There is no one definition of drought. Great Britain may declare a drought after just 15 consecutive days of no rainfall. In Libya, a drought is declared only after two years without rain. There is little debate about the effects of drought. Famine has killed millions. Africa is more at risk than any other region. There seem to be no clear patterns, although some scientists believe there may be a connection between great storms on the sun and drought on Earth. Some cultures have devised intricate ceremonies to beseech the gods for rain. However, no rain dance could have helped in the American Dust Bowl of the 1930s, a drought aggravated by poor farming methods in the Midwest. Clouds of soil were swept up by winds, suffocating people and animals and darkening the sky as far east as Washington, D.C. When drought parches the land, it carries with it the potential for even more disaster. An arid region is at its most vulnerable to fire.
Every year, vast areas go up in smoke, often with little immediate consequence to human populations. But the all-consuming nature of fire may devour dwellings and lives. Dry winds and punishing heat can quickly turn a lush forest into a tinderbox. When such a forest fire takes hold, it can seem like a driven animal. Burning embers fly into the sky and seed yet more fires. Then again, the results are not all bad. Life has evolved to survive the presence of fire. Many plants are immune to a brief scorching. Some have seeds that cannot germinate without a dose of extreme heat. The fire can also cleanse a forest of diseases, giving it new strength. Some animals manage to survive even the worst of nature's infernos, outrunning the flames or sheltering underground or in water. The greatest natural disaster of all would be far more difficult to escape. It would come from outer space, an enormous meteorite dwarfing the millions of harmless ones that fall each year as shooting stars. Yet even this event would be a natural disaster. When Earth rumbles and roars, it can seem a cruel home indeed. But among all the known planets, it's the only home to life.